despite being synonymous with the decade, Dallas's first episode to air in the 80s didn't come until over midway through the third season. So strap in. We're about to tear down that wall, find out where the beef is, discover what Willis was talking about, welcome Schwarzenegger back from wherever he went, and experiment with a little new Coke. I want a new drink. No, I, I meant the drink. Jesus, Hugh Anthony Craig III. Oh, and we're going to find out who shot JR. Spoiler alert from 1980. After a couple of episodes off, Kristen and Alan Bean returned to the forefront to pick up their Real Housewives of Dallas act. Kristen lies to JR about Alan being in the office, which makes Alan look flaky and gives Kristen a chance to big time him. And wow, this conversation is rife with queer subtext. What's the matter with you? You know how important I am to JR. You're replaceable. Once the Barnes campaign is over, you're back on the streets. You're afraid if I get too close to JR, I'll cut you out. He needs me. Mm -hmm. In only one way. They might as well have just had Alan tell her she'll never be able to satisfy JR the way he can. In a funny little sitcom like Quirk, JR and Kristen agree to meet at an out of the way restaurant where they can keep a low profile and they nearly run into Alan and Lucy, who chose it for the same reason. Alan convinces Lucy to duck out instead of revealing their romance. Too bad, they could have also run into Sue Ellen and Dusty Farlow, or Bobby and Jenna Wade, or Jock and Julie Gray, or Ray Krebs and that one lady from the bar. There are a lot of inappropriate relationships on Dallas is what I'm getting out here. At the love shack, Kristen ponders whether JR is sick of her just like he got sick of her sister. This is a great little moment because every chance the writers have had, JR has treated her as disposable. At Alan's place, Lucy wants to attend Cliff Barnes's roller derby fundraiser in the sexiest, skimpiest outfit Alan's ever seen. And Alan, I giggle you not, asks why she would want to do such a thing. Oh, come on! Oh, and for those who are following along with the queer reading of Alan Beam, check out how he kisses Lucy in these pillow talk scenes. It's illustrative. More bedtime conversation as we catch up with Jock and Ellie. Ellie is too skittish about her surgery to jump back into the Dallas social scene. Jock is frustrated and worried, but he gets it. Hamby returns from a night on the town with Donna and Ray. They make with the smoochies, but Pam stops to warm up some milk, killing the mood. Or making it kinkier, I don't know which. Over at Donna's, Ray gets ready for his requisite walk of shame, and accidentally overhears that Donna is going to inherit a small fortune. Ray certainly fell back asswards into love with the right woman. Now as long as he doesn't screw it up, uh, you know where this is going. At the Ewing breakfast, Lucy celebrates a letter from Valine, prompting Ellie to wistfully wish for Gary and Val to return to South Fork. Like Bobby, Ellie is just fixated on family being together, regardless of how they feel about one another. I mean, Lucy just said Gary is happy in California. Let him be happy. JR quickly tries to change the subject by noting it's a great day for Ellie and Jock to visit Punk Anderson, but Jock snaps at him for bringing it up. Everyone suddenly gets very awkward as Jock tries to cover for Ellie's insecurity. JR tries to cover for being out with Kristen until 3 a.m. Well, I had dinner and drinks. Uh, some of the boys in the old cartel want to get in on our Asian deal. And Lucy tries to cover for being out with Alan Beam. We also get an update on Pamby's torrid night of passion. It never went off. I just wanted to say that I'm sorry about last night. Pam apologizes for ruining the night, but we never find out what for. Maybe she fell asleep. Maybe she forgot she was lactose intolerant. Whatever the reason, Bobby is disappointed and he won't be able to make it up because he has to babysit JR. Which the episode's framing makes sure to note is Pamela's fault. I would be remiss in not mentioning Jock's use of ya dig. Would you be sure you do your lesson for midnight on school nights? You dig? Just hang loose blood. She's gonna catch up on the rebound on the med side. What it is, big mama? My mama didn't raise no dummies. I duck her rap. Cut me some slack, Jack. Yeah. JR tries to get one over on Lucy by telling her not to keep bringing up Gary and Valine, or else he'll expose her lies. She counters that she'll reveal that JR was meeting with Kristen, not the cartel, which completes the trifecta of viewing women getting the last word on JR over the past few episodes. At Kristen's apartment, the threesome of J.R., Kristen, and Alan Beam, Alan, Alan Beam meet to discuss Barnes for Congress. Apparently, Cliff still has some money left, which means that Alan Beam isn't spending it fast enough. 
Alan assures JR that the roller skating fundraiser will finish him off. Of course, Alan and Kristen get in a few digs at one another. Said fundraiser looks like it's going to be a hit with the youths, including Muriel, Lucy, and Lucy's rainbow suspenders. How about those rainbow suspenders, huh? Dad. Pretty cool way to keep your pants up, eh? We get some good anti-Kristen scheming from Alan as he hires one of his lady friends to deliver the Barnes report. Kristen tries to block her and gets pushed aside by JR. Enraged, Kristen tries to get a hold of Alan, but only manages to contact a time-traveling Alexis Bledel. Blowback from Project Messenger Bag comes swiftly in the form of Kristen snapping some pictures of Alan and Lucy together. Alan is still with Betty Lou, though, despite spending all of his time with Lucy. When Kristen rats Alan out to JR, Alan is shocked to find out that JR is all in favor of the relationship. In fact, he wants to set Alan up with his own law practice. In Chicago. Far, far away from South Fork. With one fewer tie to South Fork, JR thinks he'll be done with Gary, Valine, and that whole side of the family. Bobby and Pam are still having bedroom issues. Pam freezes up whenever he touches her, which is an understandable symptom of PTSD. Bobby continues his streak of being a nice guy right up to the point where he's mildly inconvenienced and passive-aggressively moves to the El Paso side of the bed. Real mature. At the Beamer Dome, Alan pops the question on Lucy, who, for once, thinks things through about her love life and concludes that she can't get married. In Dallas terms, she is coming off the Kit Mainwaring engagement less than a year earlier. Alan lays in the guilt trip, but she draws some healthy boundaries. When that manipulation doesn't work, Alan gets some advice from the master manipulator. John Ross Ewing Jr. JR's advice? If you love someone, set them free. It doesn't sound quite as nice the way he says it. Well, she's a Ewing. We always seem to want things we can't get. Serena, Alan Beam's messenger, tries to get through to JR, but Kristen stonewalls. She also turns up the heat on JR to get Alan and Lucy married off. In a nice bit of serendipity, Alan goes cutthroat in one scene ending Barnes for Congress and his relationship with Lucy. I'm afraid we're going to have to cancel Barnes' radio spots. What are you talking about? Lucy, what's the point? And part two of the plan happens immediately as JR shows the rest of the family the Polaroids Kristen took of Lucy and Alan together. JR forbids her to be involved with a penniless, ruthless social climber. Penniless, ruthless social climber. Penniless, ruthless social climber. Penniless, ruthless social climber. Bobby, who has met Alan Beam one time for 30 seconds, chimes in to tell Lucy she could do better, unwittingly contributing to the plan. Lucy is so headstrong that she not only refuses to break up with Alan, she invites everybody to the wedding. And we're out! Power play is J.R. Ewing at his conniving best. You just have to ignore that this is the third string side quest for J.R. behind the Asian oil well deals and dicking over Cliff Barnes. As with the previous episode, Love and Marriage, though, it's the way he sets up multiple independent pieces to work with each other. But he would have been really good at mousetrap. As I've mentioned before, there's absolutely nothing in the modern setting that indicates that Gary is any kind of threat to JR, so this plot to drive Lucy away is unnecessarily cruel. But looking at it through JR's delusional love starved brain, Gary came in and took Miss Ellie away from him. JR was so quiet, so shy. When I took him shopping, he, he held onto my skirt so tight. And then when Gary came along, doctors took over raising JR. It's not surprising that a buried, illogical part of JR's brain thinks Gary stole the safe, inviting position as Ellie's son. Yeah, well, sometimes a man has to become ruthless. Or one of these days, somebody walk into your house and take away everything you got. And it also explains why JR, after going through the hypermasculine crucible that is life with Jock Ewing, further resents Gary for running off and throwing away the comfort Miss Ellie provided. Gary has no character. That's what hadn't changed. It would be like someone living paycheck to paycheck watching as someone accidentally sets their winning lottery ticket on fire. You feel sorry for them, but you also kind of resent their stupidity for not cherishing the thing that you want. I mean, most of this is just Citizen Kane if Gary were a sled instead of a little brother. I've mentioned that Lucy is the character who sees through people, but her kryptonite seems to be her own love life. That continues here, but in fairness to Lucy, her instincts were solid. She knew it was too soon to get married to Alan, but he and JR worked her from both sides into a rash decision. Of course, hooking up with Alan Beam in the first place probably wasn't a sound decision. 
But God, now I sound like Bobby. Frankly, I think you could do better. Speaking of Bobby, an interesting thing about his feud with Pamela over her late work hours is how confrontational he is with her and how much he defends or deflects with everyone else in the house. She's been putting in long hours. It's just something she feels she has to do, that's all. He's absolutely capable of explaining an empathetic position to Jock and Ellie, but his actual conversations with Pamela constantly try to pressure her into motherhood. I'm not sure if it's more annoying because he clearly gets it and still pushes Pamela, or if it's sweet because he'll defend her side of things even when he doesn't believe it himself. Or, I guess splitting the difference, he defends her side because he wants to keep the peace, not because he wants to defend Pamela's reputation. It's probably that third thing. And speaking of Pamela, there will be a lot on her later, and probably in its own video. But this episode is indicative of how she's treated throughout the season, and really starting in season two. Basically anything that would cause a fight between Bobby and her will happen, no matter how contrived. And it makes any Pamela storylines needlessly frustrating as a result. Finally, in an understated debut, we meet Stephanie Blackmore's Serena Wald, Ellen Beam's messenger come sex gift to JR. You wouldn't know it from this episode, but Serena actually sticks around for a while, all the way to the penultimate season, in fact. Blackmore's resume looks identical to basically every woman who guested on this show. A Magnum P.I. here, a love boat there, and retirement in the early 90s. It's a stark reminder of the hard partition there was between film actors and TV actors until the mid-90s, that almost every actress in her 20s has the same set of guest shots. Anyway, this is a great entry point if anyone wants to know what the big deal is about J.R. Ewing. The plot to drive Lucy away is vintage John Ross, even if it's one of lesser stakes. But next episode, business is about to pick up. Then the baby is yours. <laughs>